So can you tell me um, who you are and what you are doing here? <laughs> Well, I'm Barbara Moser-Mercer, and I'm a professor at the University of Geneva in the Faculty of Translation and Interpreting. And I um, direct the project called InZone, uh, in short, Interpreting in Conflict Zones. And we specialize in training humanitarian interpreters who work in conflict zones. So what I was told, the way I heard about you, the way it was presented to me is there's a lady who's done MOOCs in refugee camps. <laughs> so what, what is it that you've, you've actually done and how have you done it? <laughs> well, based on our fairly lengthy experience now of uh, blended learning in fragile contexts, uh, I decided to uh, test out what it would mean to take a MOOC in a refugee camp. So uh, I uh, was out uh, in Dada because I was uh, investigating the IT infrastructure for launching a new in-zone course for 40 UNHCR interpreters. And I got to know two refugees who'd been referred to me by UNHCR as being interested in taking part in such a case study. We then, uh, I then selected uh, two or three MOOCs from the Coursera platform because we the University of Geneva partners with Coursera and uh, took the decision. Uh, the decision was in favor of one uh, MOOC on, uh, offered by the Commonwealth Education Trust on um, teaching and learning. And uh, for five weeks, uh, the two refugees took the course in Darab and I took it in a high connectivity environment after setting it up there. And what happened? What, was what happened? Um, I uh, carefully documented each and every challenge, uh, knowing already ahead of time what uh, types of challenges I would encounter. Um, they were mainly of the technological nature, but also of a cultural and linguistic nature. Can you describe the context? What does a camp look like? How many people? What? It's a closed environment, but a very specific kind of environment. What, what can you tell us about that from an educational perspective? From an educational perspective, yes, Dadaab is the world's largest refugee camp with almost a half a million uh, refugees, 95% of them Somali. So it's a fairly homogeneous, culturally homogeneous uh, environment. Uh, there are actually six different camps, uh, and not all of them are equipped the same way for learning. Uh, some of them are better equipped than others. Uh, and access, I would say, to, uh, to learning outside of the secondary schools uh, is mostly via, uh, via mobile phones, via cell phones. Okay, yeah. So, for, so what, what, what are people, I mean, what kinds of learning opportunities are people looking for in that context? What do they want to learn to do? Uh, I think, in, although I'm not an expert in this, and I, I think you know, I would have to refer this back to UNHCR, but uh, from what I've heard and what I've learned from our own learners is that uh, they're eager uh, to acquire skills that are actually uh, usable and will improve their livelihoods. Uh, they're looking for certification. Uh, I think I had hugely underestimated the importance of certification, of having something portable to show uh, in case they were to be resettled or repatriated, uh, but even within the camps to improve their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to them to have a document in the end that they've passed the course. So you've got five people to work with. Are they men, women? What's, uh, who I only they? had two. They were both male. Okay. Uh, and um, I, uh, there were about five, six languages between them. Uh, they were from two different countries. They were not Somalis, uh, <laughs> the exception, I would say. Uh, and yes, their level of English was not identical. One of them was actually a French speaker more than an English speaker, which ultimately did make a difference in mm. how difficult certain parts of the course uh, became for him. OK, and what was their educational background? They both had two years of higher education in their respective countries of origin. And what was their motivation? What, you know, so what was their sort of level of commitment? Were they doing this because you asked, or were they? Were, were they? Uh, their motivation really was uh, to, they liked, yes, I, I, well, they, they'd heard about InZone and they knew about us and, and they had trust in you know, our, our, our um, you know, ability to work with them. Uh, they clearly were also motivated because uh, they were going to earn a certificate in the end. Uh, they both had some sort of teaching background and the course was about teaching and learning. Right. Uh, they were interested in learning more about new 
ways of, of teaching and training. Uh, so there was that motivation, and of course I uh, had to be, you know, working within the humanitarian principles. I made sure that uh, there was never any obligation on their part to even stay on through the end of the study, uh, and I could not promise them anything up front. All I could do was make sure that all the obstacles I knew they were going to encounter were cleared uh, by me openly in collaboration with them. So what happened uh, that you did not expect? Uh, the signature track. The signature track really surprised me, uh, and I, I had not anticipated that because I'd never encountered the procedure before, uh, and it, is, uh, it really required the refugees to have access to a webcam. Uh, and each and every time they were submitting work, so this is the uh, way it could Coursera be verified. Verifies. Yes, yeah. uh, that's. Uh, and I, I insisted that they be allowed to go on signature track. I negotiated the scholarship uh, with Coursera, uh, just like I had negotiated with the Commonwealth Education Trust that all the video material uh, was downloaded by me mm -hmm. and put on USB keys and given to the refugees, uh, including the quizzes, uh, so that there would be no there would be no obstacle for them, uh, while at the same time they had to promise they weren't going to access everything uh, immediately. Uh, so, the, I mean, there, there had to be real accommodation on both sides, but trust on both sides to carry through, because I, I made, made it clear to them that the purpose of the study was to look at the potential of MOOCs in those contexts, and for them to also learn how to be potential um, e-tutors. And this is, I think, was one of the biggest motivation. It's a project that I'm carrying with me now. Um, I, I, I've identified a, a way in which refugees could improve their livelihoods by becoming e-tutors uh, without you know, the obligation or without necessarily having to be resettled or repatriated uh, or moving out of the camp. Uh, and this might have huge implications uh, for them to be mentors and tutors, uh, but trained mentors and tutors. Uh, this is basically what I'm, I'm looking at yeah. on the horizon yeah. for the millions of refugees. So what do, what do the outcomes for these two individuals look like? For these, uh, for these two individuals, the outcome was excellent. Uh, yes, there was there was coaching, there was uh, there was constant contact. Uh, however, in the spirit of learning, I uh, tried to not be too visible. Uh, I tried not to be too present. I was more present in the beginning, setting up the the context and making sure that the obstacles would always be cleared before you know they actually encountered something unsurmountable. Uh, but in the true spirit of learning, the teacher then becomes ir irrelevant uh, and the learner becomes autonomous. And they told me in the debriefing that we had, uh, which lasted quite some time, they did tell me that, yes, indeed, they noticed I was kind of checking out. Uh, but at the same time, they knew I was always there. Right. So they had that assurance that if a problem were to crop up and put their certificate in danger, they could, you know, I was just a text message away on their cell phones yeah. and they could reach me. So basically what John Dewey describes as <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. uh, the best kind of experience yes. <laughs> education. So, okay, uh, so the, the criticisms that we hear about Coursera and the MOOCs is about how they're so behaviorist, uh, the, 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 you know, the delivery of video is seen as sort of purely transmissive all of the kinds of things that educational progressives you know, hate. <laughs> and yet, here you're talking about a different sort of approach and, and take up. What, what's, what, what do you think of these criticisms and why, I mean, you know, so how come these two individuals in a very specific context didn't hate Coursera, the way some of us in the education, amongst education specialists do? Well, I believe their experience wasn't uh, a carbon copy of, you know, what other learners for the same course probably experienced simply because they had somebody to really accompany yeah, them. Yeah, uh, yeah. However, and, and I think one of the, the, the most valuable discoveries I made uh, in carrying out this case study was uh, that if one refugee learns, the whole village learns. And they shared with me just how the moment they had the video on USB key, they would share it with other teachers in the camp. And they would have little discussion groups. 
so I, I, I think one can criticize, you know, MOOCs and Coursera, you know, for the pedagogy that they've had to adopt, I think, in these beginning stages. But I think it's, ultimately, it's what you're going to do with it. Uh, and while, you know, a small scale um, experiment like this is certainly not uh, representative of MOOCs, I, I think it, it holds potential to be used that way. Mm. And I think it's up to us as, as trained educators to, to take and run with it uh, and, and do what we can. Uh, I, I think it is important for us, however, to be very well, to select carefully what kind of course we're going uh, to use for that. But I do know that uh, the sharing, especially in Africa, is ubiquitous. Mm. Uh, there still is a village that learns. It's not, it's not the hugely individualistic cultures and learning cultures that we, you know, we still have in the north. So are people at Coursera listening to your experience? I must say they were brilliant. I, I had the support really from everyone, uh, from Daphne Collar on down. Uh, they, in the beginning, they were a bit uh, surprised at you know, what this was all about. Uh, but negotiating the scholarships, uh, negotiating the video access, uh, even uploading some assignments via my email box uh, for them you know, to accept it. I mean, we, we all really, uh, I think, went to great lengths uh, to respect the humanitarian principles, and it, it yeah. was a pleasure to work with Coursera on that, really. Okay, that's good. That's good to hear, because this is a market that it would not be, <laughs> it's, uh, doesn't have necessarily cash <laughs> to fund. <laughs> and help. I think Coursera knows it, though, yeah. and I think, you know, if we're talking about democratizing education, uh, yeah. I, I think this is the true test. So all of the all of the research so far uh, uh, about you know sort of the demographics of the learners in MOOCs shows that they're predominantly you know sort of white middle class guys from you know, from rich countries. You know, uh, throw in some sort of elites from the BRICS, you know, so, and you've got your current MOOCs. So how come? What do you think is happening there? What's your? How do you understand? How do you interpret? The, the, the data that's being presented to us, which many people are using to say this is the proof that, you know, the sort of promise of MOOCs that it's going to sort of revolutionize education in the developing world is simply is just a market, marketing hype. Well, some of it is marketing hype. Uh, and I, I think maybe the marketing hype is even needed to uh, get people interested and piqued about, okay, so how can I now supply the evidence that it really does what it promises to do? Uh, and I think that was kind of one motivation I had. Okay, well, let me test this out. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in a fairly privileged position having worked in these fragile contexts now for years and without the trust of UNHCR uh, and their collaboration, I mean, without the community services officer with whom I worked and everyone in protection, I could not have done it. So I think it, it took really a whole village to make a small-scale experiment happen. But at the same time, I, I think everyone was willing to invest in it because I think people do see a potential in this. It, I, I think the, the ultimate uh, proof is going to be how can we adapt it uh, and integrate it into a learning, in, into an ecosystem, a term that you know, was used this morning in the session quite a lot, uh, in, into the learning ecosystem uh, in fragile context. I think that's the most fascinating thing that uh, I, I think, and, and the, 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 val well, the value added that we can bring to it as trained um, educators.